topic is the challenge of precision medicine in diabetes, essentially to talk about how the newest technological advances, especially in glucose monitoring, can improve diabetes care, and then to move this into a practical setting in terms of um, standard routine clinical practice. The breakthrough, the first breakthrough in precision medicine I want to talk about is continuous glucose monitoring. Although it is nearing almost 15 years of clinical use, it is only recent that it has become an acceptable means of monitoring glycemic control. And one of the issues that has come up repeatedly with the introduction of any technology is what is this technology? And so numerous papers have been written over the last 15 years describing in great detail um, what exactly continuous glucose monitoring is, how accurate and how reliable it is, and how it works. However, very little has been done in terms of why do we need it in the first place. And the most interesting thing about the introduction of any area of technology is that we often forget that there is an underlying purpose to the technology. And thus, consequently, it is often misused or misunderstood or misdirected. I'm gonna to try to give it some focus. The purpose of continuous glucose monitoring as an element of precision diabetes management is to measure and transmit and aggregate accurate and verified glucose data. And let me focus on those two points of accurate and verified. Self-monitored blood glucose, unless it is recorded in a device, and then that device is offloaded in a doctor's office, is virtually useless and more often than not misleading. Study after study has shown that more than 75% of the values reported by the average individual, whether type one or type two, and even in pregnancy, using self-monitored blood glucose by handing in a record book or a log book. The information given by that patient is often fabricated more often than not, glucose values are lowered to within the normal range, and it misdirects treatment. The introduction of continuous glucose monitoring removed all of those biases. So essentially, since 2008, as study after study showed, CGM was the only means of providing accurate and reliable glucose da data upon which to characterize the individual's di diabetes in terms of its diagnosis, to initiate and adjust therapy, and ultimately to determine whether the therapy is clinically effective. That raises an interesting question. All of the studies that we have seen since the introduction of CGM that did not use CGM provided self-monitored blood glucose data, more often than not unverified. The Accord trial in the United States is a good example of that. Thus, the conclusions drawn from such trials related to glucose control have to be re-examined, and perhaps such studies have to be repeated, this time with the accuracy and the reliability of continuous glucose monitoring. A second breakthrough in precision medicine has been the introduction and acceptance of the ambulatory glucose profile, a means of representing glucose levels that previously was impossible, except within confines of a hospital. So why do we need a means of representing the glucose data? Well, we have large amounts of glucose data up to 288 readings a day, and one cannot look at each value. The key to understanding CGM is it provides a diurnal glucose pattern that if employed correctly, can accurately detect abnormalities that enable precise diagnosis, treatment decisions, 
and assessment of clinical efficacy. So these two developments in precision diabetes management, first CGM, the technology, and then a means of taking that technology and using it in clinical practice, as well as in research and education. In 2021, the American Diabetes Association established AGP as the standard of care by which CGM data should be represented, and its analytics as the standard by which we should quantify glucose values. Issues such as glucose variability can now be directly addressed in practice, and if, direct, if correctly addressed, then it could lead to improved clinical outcomes and potentially prevent the complications the previous speaker spoke about. My responsibility is to help you understand precision medicine and real world, real world diabetes management. And so I want to begin with these three challenges. First, to understand the CGM technologies and its associated analytics. To use the technology to more precisely characterize this glycemia and to apply metabolic profiling to the management of diabetes. Precision medicine and metabolic profiling, what does that mean? Metabolic profiling is a means of taking glucose data and allowing it to direct us in our clinical decision-making and our better understanding of diabetes. By using CGM to identify the distinguishing features within diabetes that would contribute to a greater diagnostic specificity and consequently improve, improve treatment. And I'll show you this in a moment. And by using CGM to characterize glucose exposure variability and stability in terms of their distribution, magnitude, frequency, and duration. One of the previous speakers pointed out that glucose was a very important factor in the development of complications, one of the key factors. However, what was missed in that presentation was an interesting point. HbA1c of 8% in some cases leads to a complication and in others leads to a complication-free diabetes without any explanation, as the speaker said. However, we think we have an explanation for it. 8% A1C is not the same in every individual. And it is that difference that we have to identify because it may be the key to understanding why individuals with lower A1C developed complications and with higher A1C do not. Here is my point in a simple slide. The previous two speakers mentioned A1C as a critical factor in understanding diabetes. And here is an estimated A1C of 5.7%. But none of the listeners can tell me whether there was hypoglycemia, and if there was, when it occurred, how frequently, what was its magnitude, what was its duration, and the same for hyperglycemia. Essentially, we are blind. There is no precision in knowing the HbA1c. And here is my evidence. This is the profile that was produced by an A1c of 5.7%. It has significant hypoglycemia overnight, significant variability, the glucose is unstable, and there are periods of hyperglycemia. Yet, by both speakers, 5.7% would not be treated unless we had already defined this person as having diabetes. And even if they had diabetes, most physicians would accept the 5.7% and wonder why the, the individual had retinopathy when the HbA1c was so good. My argument is simple. The HbA1c is not so good. 
It is not an indicator of variability, of hypoglycemia, or of stability. Three factors that essentially go undetected when we simply know the HbA1c. What does the AGP give us in pro metabolic profiling that the A1c does not? It tells us where the hypoglycemia is, where the excess glucose is, where the stability lies, and where the variability lies. And those factors and understanding their distribution and frequency enable us to provide a more precise metabolic profile that in turn allows us to treat diabetes more precisely and therefore get better outcomes. My work began at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, as you saw, and I moved to Minnesota with the International Diabetes Center and Mayo Clinic. In my later years, I wanted to work with a group that believed that CGM was the basis for clinical decision-making, not an add-on. And so I joined the group at a wonderful center, Portsmouth Hospitals University Trust of the National Health Service, and I worked very closely over the last seven years with Dr. Ian Cranston, probably the most prolific user and continuous user of CGM, certainly in the UK and maybe worldwide, and certainly always in routine clinical practice, not in a specialized center with all of the additional aids that are often required to introduce a technology. And so he allowed me to join his group and together we've followed patients since 2014 consistently on CGM with type one, type two, diabetes and pregnancy, advanced renal disease, pre-surgery, during surgery, post-surgery. And I wanna share some of our insights by in this section, reviewing two cases, two very common cases that I think most practitioners, certainly specialists in diabetes would see quite often. In this case, it's a 53 year old individual who developed type one diabetes at age 29 with a, a, severe, a history of problematic hypoglycemia, which often ended up in hospital stays. The individual does not have any warning symptoms or signs and was being routinely treated on long-acting insulin and regular insulin and made adjustments as he saw fit using self-monitored blood glucose. Individuals like this are automatically at the center in Portsmouth, put on continuous glucose monitoring as a diagnostic tool initially, and then to follow in treatment. So he was placed on two weeks of continuous glucose monitoring, Often we use blinded CGM so that the individual doesn't necessarily change his behavior and all alter the perspective. And here is the profile. There is no doubt that this individual has significant hypoglycemia. This is the same slide I showed at the beginning, but now I'm gonna give it life because I'm now associating it with, not with numbers, but with an individual who was brought to the hospital multiple times, having suffered from severe hypoglycemia. And we can see here the duration, the frequency, where the hypoglycemia occurs, in most cases overnight, but yet there are instances during the day, and how variable the glucose is. The question is, how do we treat this individual with type one diabetes? Well, we examine each characteristic in terms of its distribution, magnitude, duration, and frequency. And we do this and speak to the patient at the same time, because it's often human behavior that interferes with the simple treatments that we prescribe. And in learning what this individual does, he frequently adjusts his insulin dose to lower his glucose, not surprisingly. And that's the consequence of it. So our first intervention was to reduce glucose variability. We reduced the bolus insulin. Here is his baseline 
And here is two weeks later, our ability to reduce the overnight hypoglycemia, to allow for a higher blood glucose, which is normal if you've reduced the amount of insulin, but we can track the higher glucose, we can determine where it is, and we can introduce a means to lower the glucose. So you notice that the estimated A1C is 6.7% now, but we've reduced hypoglycemia to less than 20% of the time from a start of about 35%. Now, we continue the treatment, and the wonderful thing about continuous glucose monitoring and AGP analysis is you can see the results. We're not looking at numbers. We're looking at patterns. We're looking to see if variability has improved, if stability has improved, if overall glucose control has improved. So we want to now increase stability. We reduce the bolus insulin and remove from the individual the correction factor because it was being misused. And now you can see a greater reduction in hypoglycemia. Most of the overnight hypoglycemia is gone. So we're now down to 16%. A lessening of the hyperglycemia, the estimated A1C, has reduced and reduced variability overnight and daytime, the targets of our intervention. We're not interested in the A1C as a measure of the effectiveness of the intervention. We're interested in what we can see in the glucose profile. So the third intervention was to increase glucose exposure to avoid the hypoglycemia. We maintain the bolus insulin, but now allowing the patient the feedback from CGM, we can introduce a correction factor that the individual user can now see whether it works or not. And here you see the final results compared to where we started. The A1C is slightly higher, but that was a necessity because the hypoglycemia was keeping the glucose low. However, in summary, we lessened the excess exposure, we distributed it more appropriately, we reduced the hypoglycemia, we narrowed the glucose variability, and we approved stability, uh, the duration of stability. This is type 1 diabetes and very typical for the management of diabetes with CGM. But what about type 2 diabetes? Where do we go with that? So I've I want to introduce a second case. In this case, a 55-year-old obese individual with type 2 diabetes, very much the kind of individual who would develop complications and severe complications based upon our previous speakers. We put this individual on two weeks of CGM because SMBG could not identify any of the underlying dysglycemia. And that was the profile. This, insulin, this individual was not treated with insulin. Since he was at that borderline near 10%, he didn't quite meet the criteria of over 10% sufficiently for anybody to put him on insulin. When he was sent to this unit, he was on DPP-4, metformin, and sulfonylurea. Interestingly, you can see that the metformin, which usually affects overnight glucose, has been ineffective. The sulfonylurea has been moderately effective, and the DPP-4, it's unclear whether it has any effect at all. Given this profile, it was to the, our group obvious that we had to stabilize glucose control first before we could lower excess glucose. We did that with the introduction of GLP-1. Previous experience with GLP-1, was very positive, but each individual patient being different, we wanted to see what were the results with this individual. Here is the first profile after two weeks of being on a GLP-1. Notice that it has narrowed, that the curve has flattened, the median has flattened. So we've reduced the variability, 
we've done had an effect upon the excess glucose um, uh, exposure, and we've reduced the ex any risk of hypoglycemia as well. We've narrowed all of those factors that should lead to better metabolic control, but we did not move the individual within the goal set. To do that, it was clear that long-acting insulin would be required. Now note, the A1C was already reduced to 8.5%, and a misnomer in treating type 2 diabetes is just because you managed to lower the A1C without insulin does not mean the individual does not require insulin. And we can see this very clearly in the progression of treatment. Once on insulin, take a look at the profile. This is as near normal as an individual with type 2 diabetes is likely to get. The profile has the characteristics of an individual without diabetes, which then prevents you from complications. First, the median is almost flat. Second, the interquartile range or the variability is narrow. Third, there is almost no excess glucose in this individual's profile at this time. So we continue with the long-acting insulin because it's providing us with that means to stabilize glucose within the normal range. This is very low dose insulin, but it still has had a profound effect on lowering the glucose. Take a look at where we started. Take a look at where we ended. This is what diabetes is about, and this is what treatment is about. It's not about an A1C. It's about improvement in all measures, in exposure, in variability, and in hypoglycemia. If done correctly, precision medicine is the means of achieving levels of glycemic control previously unavailable and undetectable because we didn't have the right technology to understand whether we had achieved this level of glycemic control. Our AGP case studies, the two I presented, show a diurnal glucose pattern, identify the underlying dysglycemia, characterize the defect with precision, guide treatment decisions, and result in improved clinical outcome. It is said that science will dehumanize people and turn them into numbers. Nowhere is that more prevalent than in the world of diabetes. Speaking of HbA1c, time, time and range, and other measures, in almost a misguided effort to reduce the significance of the technology that will guide us much more closely to the precision we seek, just like the genetic side of precision medicine, the practical side must take precedence and it must help to guide us in our clinical decisions. This 8% has much greater meaning when we look at the profile. So we must rid ourselves of reliance on the single measures, which we give much too much importance to. Technology allows us to collect reliable and accurate data and employ that information to produce metabolic profile that more precisely detects this glycemia, which leads to better diabetes management. Thank you very much. I want to thank my colleagues initially at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, the WHO Center, and especially Reed and Andy Basu with their work with me at Mayo Clinic in our WHO Collaborating Center, and most especially my colleagues at Portsmouth Hospital University Trust, where all of this work was accomplished in normal routine practice. And a special thanks to Dr. Banshee Sabu and his outstanding team who made my participation possible. Thank you very much.